buyers are writing offers after seeing three to four homes. I hope everybody was listening to that. I hope that that is something that we're sharing with our purchasers to set that expectation before we start showing houses to them, right? What, what a great topic um, of conversation to have with them before we take them out. Amy, it's good to see you. Today we're going to be discussing pricing, CMAs, and why can't I just use a CMA as my listing presentation? Huh. <laughs> so uh, Arusalem the other day um, was, was going over uh, a survey that W and H Studios uh, did. They are the owners of Cloud CMA. They asked a bunch of agents, what's in your CMA? And I thought that some of the facts were um, rather interesting. This is kind of hard to read. Maybe you can yeah, yeah try to zoom in a little bit on that. Thank you. Um, so we're going to get into this a little bit. But let's may almost start, Amy, with what is a CMA? Right. And why is it different than a listing presentation? Because frankly, some of these good CMA programs, they have so many add-ons, you can almost make it into a listing presentation, but I think you and I agree that that's a pretty big shortcut. Well, I think definitions help. Uh, CMA stands for what? You know, comparative market analysis. So if your comparative market analysis has your bio and your testimonials, I don't think that's a comparative market analysis. Um, I think a CMA is normally a subset of all the things we present to the consumer. And I was uh, sharing on Monday that I had been reading the book Influence and they talk in there about how you can persuade a consumer with price or with the perception of value, or you can be persuasive by making their decision making easier. Right. When you influence the decision, it can be all about price, which is one of the one of the components of having a discussion sure. with the seller. We're either negotiating the price at which we're going to put the house on the market, and we're also negotiating our own price. Um, but the wonderful thing about having a really long programmatic listing process is you lengthen the relationship and you give them more things to work with to make a decision. So having the pre-listing conversation, the pre-listing communication, sending the Google survey, you know, showing up with really good things. By the time it comes to say, so seller, are you interested in getting your house on the market? You can get it listed with you at the commission that you require to provide the type of marketing mm -hmm. you do and priced at market value. And that's the way to do it. Good. So what should we be including in our CMA? So we're talking the actual pricing analysis, or are we talking about you know listing conversation? I think it's the, I think it's the actual pricing analysis. Now, yeah. when they did this survey, they asked, "Do you include your resume?" Right? I would argue, and I think that you would agree that that should be part of the pre-listing um, packet that goes to the seller. Right? So some of this is not well. No, I think it's just, yeah, I think it's just a disagreement about uh, terms, and and I think because this company does this for a living, right. To CMA is the the listing package. Yep. So I think that's the reason those are in here. So a couple interesting thoughts on this, and there was another article on Inman about this today. Um, so it's a total of twenty one percent of agents always or often include zestimates in the CMA report, hmm. and there was a there's a guy who is now retired from. Uh, Zillow, and he wrote an opinion piece um, today in Inman. His name is Jay Thompson. That that name may be familiar to some of you out there. He was with Zillow Group for many years, and was he was on you know the big Facebook groups, kind of defending Zillow or at least trying to share the the facts of Zillow from Zillow's point of view. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that agents are rather foolish to not be discussing um, zestimates. And in markets where there are I buyers, be discussing I buyers as well. But um, the sellers have already probably been on Zillow and they know what their estimate is. And if we don't discuss it, 
they may bring it up or they may not, but it's probably still in their head. And I thought it was, it was when we were talking about this earlier, um, Arusalam laughed because um, he argued that, uh, Jay argued that, you know, it's not a zapraisal, it's a zestimate. <laughs> and it's not a substitute for a professional pricing opinion. Sure. And, the, and Zillow says that on the site. Right. So having a conversation around a Zestimate is not that hard because Zillow says what they are and what they're not. And Zillow will even, if you dig around in Zillow, it'll tell you what their accuracy, what they believe their accuracy rate is for your city. Sure. So I think, you know, manning yourself, arming yourself with, you know, what is the Zestimate for that property that you're going to be discussing with the seller? How accurate does Zillow think the Zestimate is? And then... You know, you know, knowing the difference between a Zestimate and an appraisal to have that discussion with the seller, I think just makes good sense if yeah. they bring it up. And maybe yeah. it makes sense to bring it up anyway. I think his argument is rather interesting, right? Even if they don't bring it up, you do. And say, sure. oh, by the way, right? We also know that Redfin, I think Redfin State is a little bit better because they're an actual brokerage, right? Um, they have their, you know, Redfin estimates. People are familiar with these things. So we can kind of ignore the elephant in the room, which Redfin is a huge company. They get a huge number of eyeballs on their site and Zillow is even bigger. So at least having this information in our back pocket, I think makes sense. How do you feel about just sharing? I don't know that I'd share Redfin because you know they're known for you know doing things on the cheap, but would you recommend, and we haven't really discussed this, but would you recommend going over this estimate with the seller, whether they bring it up or not? I'm just curious. Yeah, well, I think it sure does depend on the market. Um, and I'm only saying that because you may be bringing up things that are a distraction. But yep. in, in general, the quick answer is, yeah, I think let's be prepared to show them everything. And let's do it in a pretty quick fashion because we've mm -hmm. got a lot to cover. Yep. Right. So you can say, as you can see, you know, Zillow is putting this estimate here at this. And, and here's what we have here. And here are the tax records and whatever it is, like lay out all the things and show mm -hmm. them done your homework. Um, the property that I listed just Friday, this estimate was 311. Well, I got 373. So I, I think right. going over this estimate would have been a waste of her time. It just mm -hmm. kind of wasn't even interesting enough to ponder. But yeah, Charlie, I think you're hitting on something pretty foundational. And that is be careful not to go into a listing appointment, having your seller know things you don't. Right. And, and this happens where they're like, well, what about George's house across the street? And yep. I it's happened in the early conversation with this seller. She said to me, the people down the street sold their house for X. And I said, actually, they sold it for Y. And I told her exactly. They listed it at this. Mm -hmm. They got this offer and they closed at this. And she said, oh, I knew exactly. I had done my yeah. homework. And actually, that sounds like I was talking down to her. And hopefully, in no way did I do that. I just was really clarifying. No, they didn't quite get that. Although we uh, we beat the pants out of out of that, we we did way better than them, and that was right. okay. that was crazy. So my market is accelerating at such a pace that I'm going to choose the things to present differently than I would in a more balanced market. So Charlie, I think as you and I talk about best practices for CMA, we're going to have some recommendations for always, and then some adaptations. Yeah. So suggested list price. We have a total of a quarter of people don't always include the suggested list price as part of the presentation. Talk to me about where you are on the comps that, you know, and actually sh having on paper a suggested list price that you share with the seller. We yeah. know that we're trying to get the number from them before the appointment. It's one of the questions that we ask before the appointment, right? right. Um, how much are you looking to get for your home. Some people are evasive mm -hmm. and they say, well, you know, it's your job to tell me that, this or that. We all know <laughs> that everybody has a price in their head. Some people just don't want to share it. I think knowing that ahead of time is really important. Um, but I mean, when I do a CMA report, I have a suggested list price like all the time. Yeah. But a quarter of agents, this is why I find this so fascinating, a quarter of agents seldom or never do. So Charlie, this is so funny to me because you and I talk openly in, in our shows about our different personality types yeah. and how you're an analytical and I'm an expressive. Yep. So I will tell you, I know the price, yep. but I don't write it down. Okay. Bring in the comps and then I walk them through the comps and my hope is they're going to come with me on the journey. You okay. know, 
and it's harder now on, on Zoom. I haven't figured out how to like circle things on a screen. Yeah. But normally I'm I'm there with a highlighter and a pen. Yep. Right? Look at this one had the walkout. Yep. This one yep. had I do the same thing. Yes. You know? So what you hope is that you come to the conclusion and you say, well, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, where do you think your house? You know, and then and then they choose the number. So I'm not having to sort of disappoint them with a number mm -hmm. and defend myself. Yep. Um, I know the number. I yep. don't necessarily sort of commit to it, I hope they will create it organically. Okay, so let's say the house is worth 350. Okay. Right, you go through the comps and it's yeah. obvious that it's worth 350. Yeah. But the seller says, so when you say, so you know, what do you think? Well, you know, we're just, you know, 400 is our number. Right. You know, this is the prettiest house on the block. Right. Right, we, we need this money to buy up. Right. Right, <laughs> right, or we paid X, a couple of years ago, we need to, you know, we need to make sure that we're, you know, getting that back, right? So that's an objection. Mm -hmm. um, how are you handling that when you've shown them the comps, mm -hmm. but there's just a disagreement, and the disagreement is a is a pretty hefty number. Well, this is a fascinating conversation. It's slightly off of what we intended to cover with yes, it is. punch list. But here's the thing that you have: every single agent listening, here's what you need to consider in that moment: Are you wrong? Because I'm not joking. Every once in a while, the seller will say, what about this? Yeah. The agent is actually mistaken. Okay. So you've so, so, so got to do your due diligence. You have got to work so hard to do the best that you can to understand. And pricing is not something that every agent is great at. So I'm not saying first thing you do is doubt yourself, but that's one of the things in the mix. Yeah is be, you know, really make sure you've done your due diligence. Uh, the other ways that I handle these types of objections is to just explore deeper, right? The, the thing in communication is always affirm what has been said and then do some sort of pivot or do some probing, right? And I need a much better word than that, but always affirm and say, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that you're sharing that with me or, or, or good for you or, you know, really affirm them and then dig deeper. Don't immediately try to negotiate with them mm -hmm. or, or resist because when you create this resistance, now you're negotiating with your own client. They need to feel that you're on their side and the two of you are coming along side one another to make this decision. So I would always say, oh, wow, that's that's a fantastic number. Let's talk more about that, right? Cool. Okay. It's really, yep. really big. So, but, and I've had this happen, Charlie, at the end of the day, you have to decide whether to list with someone who is wildly unrealistic. Cause you're saying it truly isn't going to sell for a penny over 350, which right now in my market, I couldn't say that. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, but in your scenario, it really won't. Would you list it at four? And I told you before we went on air, I actually had this happen. It was in a different market. Mm -hmm. uh, they were clients of mine. I had sold their mother's home. Um, they were certain that they wanted to go really, really high. I brought in an appraiser. Um, I, I did my best. It, it was a very unique home. Comping yeah. it was challenging. Um, and so I brought in an appraiser and the appraiser came in slightly higher than me, but we're talking like a Delta of like 80 grand, like okay. we were way apart. Yeah. And uh, they defied both of us and priced it super high and chased the market down for eight months. And they got um, 35 less than I expected and 50 less than the appraiser expected because they waited. Now, right. it was on them, it was their life. They were waiting for a job change and they didn't blame anyone. Um, but that was a situation where I took something overpriced because it was, and we were eyes wide open. It was yep. a very honest conversation between us. So that's, so I would say make sure you know your stuff. Yep. Bring in an appraiser if that would help you. In some cases it won't. In the olden days, Charlie, what I used to do is I would take them on a tour of their active competition. That's okay. not really appropriate in COVID to just go looking at right. comps. Um, but I would get them in the car and say, oh, wow, that's a great number. Let's go compare to what the buyers will have to choose from. You know, right now in my market, Charlie, the inventory is so tight. Yep. Uh, it makes pricing a, a unique challenge. So I don't know how much you want to talk about the now versus the norm. No, I no. I mean, I think you bring up a good point. We're in a similar market, I think, in the DC metro area. Um, high rises, I think, are having more of a challenge. You know, downtown. Oh. We're seeing some price reductions in downtown DC high rises. Um, that you know, these would have sold in a weekend yeah. six months ago, right? Yeah. You know, and they're sitting now. And I think it's because oh. people are rethinking COVID and where they want to live. Well, let's talk about those numbers because I will tell you, I use those in every market analysis conversation, right? It's average days on market yep. or the target property, right? Um, 
in, in a more balanced market, um, your solds are everything, right? What are the sold comps? Mm -hmm. Um, when, when markets are changing direction dramatically, like they are now, um, average days on market is a valuable one list to sell ratio at the time of contract is a valuable, valuable yep. number. And I don't pull it for the County. I don't pull it for all of MLS. Right. I pull it for the comps. Um, for me, list to sell ratio is right around a hundred plus percent, yep. depending on the neighborhood. And that's a valuable thing, mostly to show to buyers. <laughs> right. Oh, um, absolutely. But days on market, you know, I can say here, let's look at 30 days and, and I don't go far guys right now for me comping. Um, if I have to go 60 days to get enough data points, I might, but wow. Um, you can't go too bar far back in the past before you're just looking at stuff that isn't true. Right. <laughs> it's not relevant. Okay, <clears throat> so, what else do you include in the CMA? So days on market list to sell ratio. I don't do cost per square foot unless you're looking at an extremely, like you were talking about high rise. If every single unit is the same, maybe that's yeah. an interesting number. Um, but I don't use cost per square foot and I have to talk new agents out of doing that because that's a little bit treacherous. Yep. Um, I'm scrambling to think. I should have bulleted these out before we went on the air. What are you thinking of as data points, Charlie, that you would also include? I would just say we want to make sure that we include everything. Right. Yeah. And we want to make sure that we're taking a look at the tax records and see if see if anything is sold that's not part of the MLS that was sure. not included in, in the sure. in the MLS. And I would encourage us to also make sure that we're looking at canceled, withdrawn, temporarily off. So I think it can be easy to forget about that stuff. Mm -hmm. and we don't want to forget about all of those properties. I think that that's important. Um, other than that, I think you and I are on the same page when it comes to the actual CMA, right? And there's some there's some fluff here that should be in the pre-listing presentation like you and I talked about a minute yeah. ago, but the actual CMA, I think that we're good. And you and I, I think do it the exact same way. We've not done it in person, but I like to print out the comps. Mm -hmm. um, I don't use a CMA tool generally. I just print yeah. out the comps yeah. and I highlight and I circle and I star and I mark up and then I literally go through it with the client, you know, sheet by sheet. Mm -hmm. um, I just, that's how I've found to do it. Um, that's effective for me. Um, and I have yet to find a decent way to do that online. And I like to, you know, mark it up before I get to the house. Yeah. So um, I'm not, you know, struggling to find a number or something. Yeah. But, you know, I'm just going through, you know, what they start at, what did they end up at? Mm -hmm. um, how long were they on the market? And, you know, is there an anomaly, right? Or all of the units um, that we're looking at have a one car garage, but this one had a two car garage, right? Or two or two parking spaces in the garage instead of one. Yep. So um, yeah, uh, I think that that makes a lot of sense. So the, the other thing that's on here is um, property adjustments. I strongly discourage agents from doing that. You just probably don't have the skill. And I think you yep. can really, really skew it. Um, my first business partner in my career way, way, way back in the day was an analytical. And he had a spreadsheet that had a, adjustments for everything you could possibly imagine. And he was really good at it. Uh, and in three hours, he would have the most perfect CMA you could imagine. Mm -hmm. And me being the buyer's agent on the team, I knew that market like my heartbeat. And yeah. I would go through the comps and in 30 minutes, he and I would come to the same number uh, because I'm not an analytical. But yeah. most people don't have that skill. I think if you're doing plus or minus three grand on a fireplace, you're going to trip yourself up. Yep. So I would not use that um, unless you have mad skills and you also have experience as an appraiser. Um, the other thing is you just really, Charlie, I think you made a great point about do everything, bring everything. Um, I would create a standard, which is, you know, yes, the tax records and every possible mm -hmm. thing and have it all available and then gauge your audience yep. prepared to deliver the cliff notes version of the statistics for the listener, depending on their tolerance, right. and if you have a very analytical seller, be prepared to give them everything. And if you don't, don't, because you really might wear them out. Um, years ago, I had a client, uh, an elderly lady that I had done a lot for. I had even helped her paint her house, like physically with my hands. Mm -hmm. And I really thought I had this listing in the bag. And she mentioned that she had interviewed with somebody who was the big guns in my market at the okay. time. She mentioned the name and I'm like, Whoa. she said, do you want to see her listing presentation? And I was like, uh, yeah, <laughs> she gave it to me. She gave me this woman's list. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm so lucky. It was pulp. It was this many pages with that plastic scrunchy binding. Mm -hmm. 
of like everything that you could possibly find in the public record. It impressed this woman. She said, this is better than yours. Mine was thinner, mine was yeah. marketing focused, mine was right. visually driven. What I didn't know back in the day, I had no understanding of personality types, was this elderly woman was very bright and very analytical. Okay. The, this level of granularity impressed her as thorough and professional. So I would say always be prepared with all the things, yes. and be prepared to set it aside or simply just give it to them and not go through it if they are not an analytical because it might be too much. What about you, Charlie? What is the limit of what you would provide? I bring what I th think I need to educate the seller. I don't have a certain amount. Um, I went on an appointment a few weeks ago and I went back, I think I went back six months because it was just for one building, right? And we had the discussion this was before COVID and it was very interesting because you could see the line right when COVID hit, right? The days on market went, went way up, like from less than a week to three weeks. And it was like right that April timeframe. It was so interesting bringing that to them and they knew that they had a problem, right? Yeah. You know, this unit's sitting vacant, they moved out. Um, there was an anomaly with it as well. It was a two, two, uh, two garage spaces in the in the um, building garage. Yeah. Almost every other unit in the building has one. How do you price for that? Right. Well, I, well, I paid the developer forty thousand for that space. Well, no right. one's going to pay an extra forty thousand for that space now. Right. You know. So, Charlie, I, you I don't have a hard and fast rule. I think I okay. I, I look through and I yeah. see what I think is best, and that's what I print and mark up, and off we go. Yeah, and I think I know we're at time. We gotta we gotta wrap up. But I think you've brought up something super, super valuable when you said you went back six months. When I say I go back 30 or 60 days, yep. I mean in what I'm gonna hang my hat on. Yep. You need to go back as far as you need to go back to understand. Right, a absolutely. You have to know more than your client. Yep. You can't be the one who didn't know this or this or this about the neighborhood, the trends, the, the builder, whatever. Yeah, do your due diligence on the neighborhood. Uh, we have provided, I think, at least to Remax Allegiance agents, you have access to the, the market study that I shared. And it's just a little bit granular vision of a neighborhood or a subdivision. You walk in with that done, you know, it just really does help you to understand your product. Awesome. Uh, let's leave it there. Uh, on Friday, I have a special guest, Kevin Bailey, is going to be joining me. He is the DC attorney for Community Title Network. Uh, Amy, you and I will be back on Monday. Uh, good to see you. Have a good weekend.